and Yonina, would you mind checking what's at the very top there of my script, the way I worded that, that they're all in their homes, just so people know for COVID safety? Uh, all in their own homes tonight.
Good evening and welcome to the official Leadership 2020 debate for the BC Green Party. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Adam Olson, the interim leader of the BC Greens and the MLA for Saanich North and the Islands in the beautiful Saanich territory that I'm so honored to represent in the British Columbia Legislature, in the place that's been home to countless generations of my ancestors. Tonight, you'll hear from people in territories across our incredible province. Our leadership candidates are joining us from the territories of the Seashelt Nation on the Sunshine Coast, the Cowichan Nation in the Cowichan Valley, Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil Nations in, the, in Vancouver, and our moderator is joining us from the territories of the Semiamu, Keitsi, Coquitlam, Kwantlen, Kikite Nations in Surrey. I raise my hands in gratitude to each and every one of you for joining us this evening. Thank you. I know this online event wasn't what we imagined when we launched our leadership contest back in January, but like so many British Columbians, we have had to adapt to the realities of the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, I'm speaking to you from a tent on my patio. All spring and summer, I've worked through the construction noise and beside the play area of the Olson family home. For most of the past six months, this tent has been the office where I've hosted constituent calls, met with Premier John Horgan, joined in debate in budget estimates, participated in monthly provincial council meetings, and worked with my incredible constituency and caucus teams to navigate one of the most unique and challenging times in recent history. I am proud of what we have accomplished despite these challenges on behalf of our party, our constituencies, and all British Columbians. Our work has shown the importance of strong green voices in the legislature and the value citizens get from minority governments. It has been an honor to represent the BC Greens in the legislature and to serve in my second stint as the interim leader, this time in the official capacity as the leader of the third party. I have so many good feelings and gratitude for our BC Green Riding Associations who have put a lot of work into this contest. Many of them have hosted innovative digital events to ensure their communities have a chance to meet our leadership candidates. You can check out the recordings of those events on the BC Greens YouTube page. Don't forget, tomorrow, September 2nd, is the last day to register to vote for our new leader as a supporter or a member. And I want to see you all voting, so make sure you head to the Leadership 2020 section on the BC Greens website to register if you're not already, or get in touch with the party if you're not sure. You'll have from September 5th to September 13th to rank your choice of candidates and submit your ballot. I look forward to an interesting debate tonight, and I hope you'll enjoy hearing from our three candidates. And with that, I'll now turn it over to our debate moderator, Nitu Garsha. Nitu? Thank you very much, Adam. And good evening to all of the viewers tuned in via YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter as we adapt to these unprecedented times with a virtual debate. And of course, good evening to our candidates, all in their own homes tonight, who I'll introduce in alphabetical order. Cam Brewer is in Vancouver. Kim Darwin is in Seashelt. And Sonia Firstino is in Shawnigan Lake. And tonight, party supporters will hear the three BC Greens leadership contenders square off in the official virtual debate. We're going to tackle major themes tonight based on questions that British Columbians want answered and debated. There are three moderator questions to go through tonight as we work on tackling major themes based on those 500 questions that we had submitted. I want to begin by going over some of the rules for tonight's debate and ensure that everybody is on the same page page, and they are fairly straightforward. Candidates will have one minute to respond to most questions. There's a portion where they have an opportunity to ask questions to each other, to the candidate of their choice, where they will have 45 seconds. There is an open debate portion where candidates have two and a half minutes to openly debate the topic at hand. During that time, candidates will raise their hands in order to indicate that they would like to jump in, and I will be facilitating that. And finally, we will have video questions that have been submitted by both industry leaders as well as uh, from party supporters from across the province, which we will be playing as well. Well, we know that British Columbians want answers, so let's go ahead and get started with the first segment of this debate. Again, there are three moderator-led questions. These are my own questions. They have not been previously provided to these candidates or their aides. Here's the first question. If elected as leader of the BC Greens under this minority government, 
Would you respect the current confidence and supply agreement with the BCNDP? Why or why not? Sonia, you are the first to respond tonight. This is an order that has been randomly selected and will be rotated throughout the evening. And you have one minute. Your time begins now. Thank you, Nitu. And thank you to everybody who's joining us tonight for this very exciting event. Uh, I am here on Coast Salish lands on the unceded territories of the Cowichan tribes and the Malahat First Nation. And I want to acknowledge that. It is important that we, we recognize that. I am a signatory to CASA. And it is absolutely my intention that we would uh, continue to adhere to the principles of CASA, which is good faith and no surprises, which is clear and open communication, and which is meant to serve people the best possible way that this minority government can serve. I'm proud of what has been achieved under this partnership and under CASA, and I will continue to stand up for the absolute best interests not only of Green Party members and supporters, but of everybody in British Columbia. That is our responsibility as elected people, and that is what I will continue to do. Cam, it is your opportunity to respond. You have one minute. Thank you, Nidu, and good evening, everybody. I'm with you on the traditional unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. So to answer your question, yes, I would respect the agreement with the NDP that's been made under CASA, it binds the caucus until the next election. But not unequivocally, if things happen that are beyond our control that we as Greens can't support, then I wouldn't support that. But keep in mind that we also don't wanna be going to an election right away. The province is facing, as we've heard already tonight, unprecedented times. People are uncertain about the future with COVID, with schools going back soon. And we need to respect the that what people in this province are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. So yes, I'd move forward with that agreement, but my plan is to focus on the future of the party so that we are stronger after the next election, we're in a better position to negotiate and that we can advance green values all across the province. All right, thank you for that, Cam. Kim, you are the next to respond. Your one minute begins now. So as Nitu mentioned, I'm speaking to you from the Shishalt Nation on the Sunshine Coast. And I ran as an MLA candidate in the 2017 election. And when our three green MLAs were elected and they were negotiating this minority government agreement, it was so exciting because after 16 years of having a majority government where there was zero cooperation across the floor, this was revolutionary and so hopeful for British Columbia as a whole. Now we know that it was, it was unique. It was the first time that we had an opportunity to enter into a minority government agreement in British Columbia. It was based on a New Zealand model, and I think it was our first practice. So if we have an opportunity to enter into one again, I'm sure we'll be a little bit more shrewd with the things that we put in there. But yes, I would keep it in place for now. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. Now to the second question from myself. There are questions about whether the BC Greens are losing relevance and if the party has been overshadowed by its partners in power sharing. How do the BC Greens separate themselves from the BC NDP? Cam, you were the first to respond this time. Your one minute begins now. Thank you, Nitu. We aren't the NDP. We're a different party for a number of reasons. First of all, we have a set of global green principles from which our policy and platforms are based. We also have a full suite of platform ideas that isn't just about the environment. I have put forward in this campaign a restart plan for British Columbia that includes restarting the economy with a clean innovation plan that will lead the world. We've got plans around cooperative housing so that people can have places to live, especially during troubled times. We have plans around indigenous reconciliation and we have a plan to manage the economy so that all British Columbians trust us. We are not the same as the NDP. We are certainly not the same as the Liberals. And we can offer a meaningful choice to everybody in this province going into the next election. And we do that by attracting the best candidates, the best people in the province step up for our party. All right, thank you for that, Cam. Kim, your one minute to respond begins now. Well, I think we have seen that the VC NDP are just the other side of the coin that we saw with the BC Liberals. 
We saw them double down in their investment in the fossil fuel industry with the $6.5 billion that they have taxpayer funded dollars that they gave to the fracking industry. Their approval of Site C we know was done to, uh, to benefit the, the fracking industry. We've seen with forestry, there, there have been very little changes uh, in the legislature as far as staff. And I, I think, again, Cam mentioned our six core principles. Those are core principles that guide BC Greens all over the world. And those are fundamental to the core of our values. Not only that, when we make decisions as Greens, we look towards the future beyond the four year election cycle. We look down seven generations as a lot of the indigenous peoples do. Thank you for that, Kim. Sonia, your opportunity to respond. Thank you. It's such an important question. We have shown our relevance in the last three years by achieving more than any opposition party has ever achieved in the history of British Columbia. You look at our 2017 platform and you can see how much have, has been implemented. We ban big money, lobbying reforms, re, uh, reforms to professional reliance, to environmental assessment. There is an innovation commissioner, commissioner, the emerging economy task force, Clean BC. We have also affected the culture of the legislature. It has been noted far and wide that there is far more uh, cooperation and collaboration happening in the BC legislature. And this last session, Adam and I were able to absolutely distinguish ourselves as a caucus from the uh, NDP in that we stopped Bill 17 and Bill 22 from going forward because of the requirement under the UNDRIP that was passed last fall was not met in our minds by this current government. We show our relevance in the legislature and we have shown it for three years. All right, thank you. Now to my third question. Events in recent months have amplified a global reckoning on racial justice. Here in this province, we've seen protests and calls for an end to systemic racism. If elected, what would you as leader do to create institutional change to better promote diversity and equality for Black, Indigenous, and people of color in BC. Kim, you're the first to respond this time. Your one minute begins now. Well, first off, I would like to see more diversity within our own party. That is first and foremost, and we one of the goals as we gather the team of MLA candidates that we take into the, the next election. And we know that the BC Green, we know that the BC legislature adopted UNDRIP and at their very first opportunity to show that they were going to act differently, we saw what happened in the Wet'suwet'en territories. That was an, a golden opportunity to show that we were going to have respectful dialogue that we, we haven't seen in the past. And I was, I was really proud that the BC Green Party with Adam Olson was the only MLA that went up and actually just had dialogue, respectful dialogue. And that is, that is something that the BC Green Party w un has committed to doing since their inception. And I would continue to do that as well. Thank you for that, Kim. Sonia, your opportunity to respond. Thank you. And we have very serious systemic racism here in British Columbia. And since I was elected in 2017, I have worked with the Indigenous community in Cowichan and with people across the province to address one of the most shocking aspects of systemic racism that continues today, which is the removal of Indigenous children at the same rate as during the, rec the uh, residential school era. This is an example of systemic racism. This is an example of how we need to work in communities. I've also worked with the black community to bring forward and have it acknowledged that this, we are more than halfway through the UN decade for the recognition of people of African descent. We have to work with communities. We have to address systemic change. I have been doing that from the beginning. I will continue to do so. This is an absolutely essential part of our work as elected people. Right. Thank you, Sonia. Cam, your opportunity to respond. Thank you. So I'm a common law lawyer. And the common law harks back 800 years to the Magna Carta. But where we are here, Indigenous people have had legal systems for 8,000 years. They're complete societies with a plurality of legal systems across the province. So one thing that I would do, and it's in my restart plan, is to revitalize Indigenous legal systems in this province. That's a way to build equality. That's a way to have certainty and lasting justice. 
So my relationship in working with Indigenous people to do this is incredibly important. And in the past, in ecoforestry, I've worked with Indigenous communities and supported Indigenous logging operations. I'm a lawyer now who represents Indigenous people and fought the Trans Mountain Pipeline on behalf of Indigenous people. So my platform includes this revitalization of Indigenous law. Val Napoleon and I talked about it. And on my website, there's a video that discusses this that I'd invite you to watch that. All right. Thank you very much for that, Cam. That concludes the first part of the moderator-led question segment. Before we move on to the second part, I'd just like to remind everyone that as moderator, I am impartial. I'm here to ensure that the debate stays on topic and on time. Now we'll move on to the candidate-specific questions from myself, beginning with Sonia. Sonia, in a recent riding association debate, you talked about campaign promises that are effective in winning an election but aren't the best policies for long-term sustainability. You highlighted the removal of Portman Bridge tolls as an example. Given former party leader Andrew Weaver's claims this past May, where he said that you were, quote, more interested in re-election than about standing up for green principles, end quote, as leader, how would you ensure the BC Green Party's ability to stand up for its policies while also being effective in a provincial election and winning seats? Sonia, you have one minute. So the way that we get policies moved forward, and we are in so many crises right now, we have a, a climate crisis, we have a, a, ra a systemic racism crisis, we obviously have the pandemic, we have ecological breakdown. We have to work to find the common ground and to acknowledge that some things, some policies should be beyond politics. We've done this in the last several months with COVID. We have shown that the parties can work across party lines and agree that the health and well-being, the safety of people has to be at the forefront. In terms of uh, specifically around transportation in Lower Mainland, I've already met with the Mayor's Council, with TransLink. We have to bring the other parties on board to recognize that we need a sustainable funding model for these, for, for transportation, for public transportation in the Lower Mainland. And the way that we do that is we get the agreement going into elections so that the outcomes that we need to have are guaranteed to happen for this province. All right, thank you, Sonia. Now to my candidate-specific question for Cam. Cam, some experts have said the post-pandemic green recovery could make or break the effort to limit global warming. But during these difficult times brought on by COVID-19, many British Columbians are struggling financially. How does your platform account for the immediate financial relief so many British Columbians are looking for right now? Cam, you have one minute. Sure, thank you. So we'll get to the, the important point that the changes are happening in the world whether we lead it or not. And I think British Columbia should be in front of the clean innovation revolution, and we should be offering those solutions to the world. But your question is about what we do immediately. <clears throat> and that's where the guaranteed income comes in. That's where we ensure that everybody is safe as they transition, as small businesses transition. I propose a small business roundtable so that those main street businesses unique of them all, are able to figure out the solution that works for their businesses. I want to ensure that people have access to therapy and counseling so that they can deal with the issues they're facing in this stressful time and move forward. So this complete package includes also everybody getting on board with the clean innovation that we need to lead the world and that we can be in front of getting a zero carbon future for everybody. So that switch happens slowly and we can help people get there. Thank you, Cam. Now to my candidate specific question for Kim. Kim, you are strategically choosing not to outline platform planks, but when it comes to the future of the party, it's important for a leader to have a plan for electoral growth. What is your specific strategy to push the Greens to be a viable political choice that more British Columbians could rally around? Kim, you have one minute. So yes, I did write an article that I was not putting out platform planks because we are a party that is guided by our membership. Our, our members can always put forward policies that then are put forward into our platform that we take into the next election. Now, what I did do is put out seven strategies that I would like to promote as the leader of the BC Green Party. My seventh one was just posted yesterday on homelessness and the opioid crisis, which, as we know, is another crisis that was declared in 2016 and that we haven't even addressed yet. 
So uh, in addition to the opioid crisis tackling that I have a circular economy, really transitioning our economy and finding the yes to the no that the BC Green Party has brand been branded with for decades. All right, thank you for that, Kim, and thank you all. That concludes the first segment of the debate. We'll now move on to the supporter questions. I will read the first one, which is about First Nations relations and action on government promises. Here's the question. What concrete steps will you take as leader of the BC Greens to create a true nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Indigenous peoples? And Cam, it's your turn to be the first to respond. You have one minute. Thank you. So I've already mentioned the very important step of recognizing pre-existing legal systems and revitalizing Indigenous legal orders. Now, building on that, though, we need to ensure that Indigenous communities have all the opportunities going ahead. So that includes Indigenous-led businesses. I mentioned clean innovation, Indigenous-led entrepreneurial activities in all parts of the provinces, especially places where there are fewer economic opportunities. I would also support indigenous owned resource tenures, especially if these are cooperatively held and that allows for the advancement of an indigenous led economy. There's also an important piece in my platform that has to do with indigenous data sovereignty. So that means that indigenous nations themselves control the collection, the use and the distribution of their own data. That's an important part of sovereignty. So with all these pieces together, we can move forward as equals and have a lasting justice. Thank you for that, Cam. Kim, it's now your opportunity to respond. Your one minute begins now. So in partnerships, in having good communication with our Indigenous partners. So in on Thursday, I interviewed Chief Patrick Mitchell from the Kanakabar Indian Band. And he described the incredible things that he has been doing in his community to build energy re resilience, food resilience. He has zero suicides in his community. He has 100% graduation rate, full payment of rent. These are empowering Indigenous communities to become self-sufficient entering into agreements where, where we can is, is something that is, is the way of our future. It's, uh, the law has been on the side of the Indigenous people every time that they've had to fight a pipeline or an LNG uh, um, in, industry. So we know that the law is on their side and partnering with them is the wise thing to Jim, do. Jim, I have to cut you off there. We're at a minute. Thank you for that. Sonia, your opportunity to respond, your one minute begins now. Thank you. And I think we should start with what we've accomplished already. So getting UNDRIP into law was the first and foremost part of our agreement with the NDP in our CASA agreement. And that was the work of the Green Caucus, our staff. And, and that passage into law was a remarkable moment in Canadian and British Columbia history. And then we followed that up, Adam and I, in this session, the first session we've had after UNDRIP became law. And when we saw that government was not shifting how it was approaching lawmaking, which is supposed to be the lens that DRIPA brings to BC lawmaking, we said that we were not uh, accepting the way that these bills had been brought forward, the lack of consultation. I've also built a leadership group in Cowichan that includes the chief of, our, of Cowichan tribes. We have to work together. We have to respect the, the, the legal framework of DRIPA, and we have to move forward so that First Nations absolutely occupy the sovereign space that they deserve. Great. Thank you very much, Sonia and candidates. Now for a portion of the debate that many of our viewers will have been looking forward to. You candidates now have an opportunity to open debate on this topic. Kim, we'll begin with you to start the debate. The other candidates are welcome to raise their hands at any point if they want to jump in, and I will facilitate that. You have a total of two and a half minutes for this open debate. Kim, please go ahead and get us started. So I was a commenter uh, on the National Energy Board with regard to the, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And we know that that pipeline runs through a number of Indigenous communities who, know, who do not want this pipeline. And that, that is the way that we can support Indigenous people as we move forward with trying to end the subsidies to the fossil Sonia, would you like to interject? Industry. 
Yeah, I think it goes beyond ending subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. For so long, Indigenous communities and First Nations have been given the choice of becoming resource extractors, and that is the only way that they get support from government. We need to look at economic opportunities that move far beyond this Pam, your opportunity to dimensional. Win. Oh, thank you. Just going to mention that I acted for the Coldwater Indian Band in the Trans Mountain Pipeline dispute. And there's a concern there about the pipeline going through the recharge zone of their aquifer. But also point out that with UNDRIP in BC, as Michael McGonigal wrote in the TIE this morning, the, the environmental assessment process in BC seeks consent. But at the end of the day, if consent isn't sought, isn't met, isn't happening, then- Have the to cut you off there for anyway. time. Kim, the floor is yours. So we also saw in the Wet'suwet'en uh, area that the fossil fuel companies pit the Indigenous people against one another. They basically coerce them to, they, they basically have jobs that they uh, try and coerce them to have. And then the traditional territory, the traditional chiefs are then pitted against the people that need to earn an income in the fossil fuel industry. So the whole communication chain with the Indigenous people. Kim, I have to cut you off there for time. Broken. Sonia, your opportunity to interject. Thank you. And I, I just want to again point to the work that I've been doing on stopping the, the trauma that comes from the removal of Indigenous children from their families and communities and the impacts that that has not only on the individual families, but on the entire community. This has to be a cornerstone of how we, we restate our relationship. Cam, you get the final peoples. word here. Thank you. Just to say that we need to move everybody, including Indigenous people, away from this terrible choice of either fossil fuel industries or no jobs. And that's why we need the clean innovation solution that the Greens can put forward. All right, that brings us to the end of this open debate. Thank you very much to all of you. The remaining questions have been pre-recorded on video, so I will not be reading them out. This next one is from Loretta. She's a single mother and a small business owner, and her topic is government COVID-19 relief measures. Let's go ahead and play the video with the question. I'm curious, if elected as a leader, what you might do to support small businesses to thrive during these challenging times especially those who have single income or single parent households. Thank you. And thank you, Loretta. Sonia, you were the first to respond. You have one minute. Yeah, thank you, Loretta. This is such an important question. And Adam and I, from the beginning of the impacts of COVID, have been advocating on behalf of small businesses, including uh, ensuring that the BC government extended the protection to small businesses from evictions. And that was something that we, we leaned into early and pushed hard. We've worked with the CFIB. We've worked with small business owners. Both of us have been uh, small business owners ourselves and, and understand the implications of, of this uh, incredible impact. Government needs to lean into ensuring that there are supports, that there are relief measures, that there is uh, additional subsidies given to small businesses to survive because our communities rely on small businesses. They are what make our communities livable and they are what provide employment and well being. And so it's absolutely essential that we put small business at the center of COVID recovery so that we're building the resilient communities that we need to have. All right, thank you for that, Sonia. Cam, your opportunity to respond, you have one minute. Thank you, so my restart plan includes a small business round table because I need to, we recognize that every business is different. Every business requires a different set of solutions. I've been talking to different business owners, small business owners during this campaign, including retailers, restaurateurs, Mike Kelly, who runs the Backroads Brewery in Nelson tells me how he used to have room for 102 people inside his tap room. Now there's room for only 48. In the summer, there's space outside in the parking spot. But when winter comes, what's he going to do? So we need to be innovative for each type of small business. That's why the round table is important. I think we can expand year round into outdoor spaces where possible, especially if streets are repurposed as, as spaces for these types of community businesses, rather than just for cars. And if those streets are greened with vegetation, space for pedestrians who can social distance, for cyclists, then we have a solution that really still binds together a community while helping small business. All right, thank you for that, Cam. Kim, your opportunity to respond, you have one minute. 
I'm a volunteer member on three business support networks, one of them being Community Futures, and we were tasked with rolling out the rural relief funds for small businesses that were not able to uh, qualify for bank, the bank rural relief. I have listened, I have been on so many webinars with so many business owners who have really rapidly had to shift their business model. And that's something that the Community Futures Organization has been incredible at doing for the small business owners. Also, one of the, the first articles that I wrote was investing in childcare and early childhood education because we know that 60% of the job losses as a result of COVID-19 have been women. And one of the best ways of being able to support women getting back into the workforce or back to their jobs is through early childhood education and childcare. Thank you for that, Kim. All right, candidates, you now have an opportunity for open debate on this topic. Cam, we'll begin with you to start the debate. Again, the other candidates are welcome to raise their hands at any point if they want to jump in. I will facilitate that. This open debate is two and a half minutes total, at which time I'll jump in to move on to the next portion. Cam, please go ahead and get this open debate started. Thank you. So one key platform piece is the universal basic income. This helps small business owners. It helps the employees of small businesses to transition because the COVID situation is still uncertain for many people. There's high unemployment on young people around 29%. And that guaranteed income allows people to transition to what's going to be next. Sonia, your opportunity to interject. In our platform for building a resilient economy, we've included things like innovation hubs, but also looking at how to work with business and labor and stakeholders on, on looking at a four day work week, which has been recognized as one of the solutions in a crisis that can help small businesses uh, be able to pivot to be able to be more successful and recognizing that businesses are not to be treated like the NDP has treated them. They need to be valued. We need to take away the EHT and, and look at that. Sonia, again. I have to interject for time. Kim, the floor is yours. A four-day work week is not something that helps small businesses. In fact, the burden of a four-day work week is placed on the small business owner. I have been, like I said, part of the business uh, community for over 20 years. And the four-day work week plank is not something that helps them. It, it also, it, in, it increases... A, the labor shortage that we that already exists. Kim, the other British candidates Columbia. are looking for an opportunity, so I have to cut you off. Cam, you're first. Thank you. So to support businesses of all kinds, we propose a green bank. Now, this is an idea that's been proposed federally. It doesn't exist in BC. It's a financial institution that with all kinds of available types of capitals that help entrepreneurs get businesses going that are nature-led, that get us to a zero carbon future. And it's available to all different types of businesses and all types of I have to cut you off, Sonia, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. I've had so many businesses reach out and I've also been in touch with Alex Pang, who's written a book about the four-day work week on how it actually contributes to better output, better uh, employee retention, happier employees. In fact, most businesses that switch to a four-day work week would never go back. And the I have Suzuki to interrupt Foundation, you, Kim, you get the final word. It, it, four day work week works with wealthier, wealthier companies, the oligopolies. So if we go to a mandated four day work week, it really will only be the wealthier companies that are able to just do to be clear, there's no mandated issues. anywhere in any part of our platform. That brings us to the end of the debate. Again, I remind candidates, if you could please raise your hand before interjecting so that we can allow a fair allotment of time to each of you during the open debate. That concludes that open debate. We'll now move on to the next video question. Thank you to all of you. This video question is from Nayira. She's a secondary student going into grade 12, and the topic is youth engagement. Please play the video. An already unstable housing market and uncertain career prospects have been made more difficult by this global pandemic. As the future leader, what will you do to ensure that youth voices are heard in the planning for the recovery and the future beyond? Thank you very much, Nayira and Kim, you're the first to respond. You have one minute. So I was absolutely thrilled when Andrew Weaver decided to form the Youth Advisory Council with the BC Green Party. In fact, I nominated one of the, the now members who is on the Youth Advisory Council. So making sure that youth have an authentic voice within the BC Green Party is something that I would be thrilled to continue. 
as well as some of the, my favorite times during the 2017 election were speaking at schools and speaking to girl guide uh, groups and organizations. In fact, after the 2017 election, I was invited back to be part of the commencement ceremonies for a grade seven graduation. I've also reached out to Gavin Dew, who has an organization specifically designed to elect millennials. And he and I are gonna continue to have dialogue and hopefully we are going to get more millennials elected within the BC Greens. All right, thank you very much for that, Kim. The next opportunity to respond goes to Sonia. Thank you, and this is so important to me. From, from the very beginning, I have invited young people into the legislature to spend the day with me there. I've had over 35 in the last three years. Uh, some have gone on to run for office and some have been successful in running for office. We have the youngest city councillor in Duncan, Jenny Capps, who spent a day with me at the legislature. Amita Kuttner was another one. Bringing youth voices into the legislature, bringing the lens of youth and young families is essential because decision-making has not been made in that building through the lens of young people for a very long time. Cedar George, a Sabletooth youth who was standing up against the TMX pipeline, asked me this exact question. I asked him to write a statement. I brought him into the legislature. I read his words right into Hansard so that they would be recorded for everybody to hear. It is so essential that youth voices are part of our legislature. All right, thank you for that, Sonia. Cam, it's your opportunity to respond. You have one minute. Thank you. So youth leaders have been an inspiration in my campaign since the very beginning. In fact, I have to admit that probably the majority of the work done in my campaign are, is by young people. We had a, a great event last week where I met with the, the BC Youth Council's environmental team and talked with them for an hour about how they can work with businesses to reduce plastic and the energy and the enthusiasm, the ideas are incredible, but I recognize it's very tough. I teach environmental law at SFU and the last term I just completed, 53 students all on Zoom, never met any of them. That's a tough way to learn. It's a tough world to enter these days. So one of the things that I've proposed in my restart plan, particularly helpful for young people, is a ministry of cooperatives. That would help establish more cooperative housing so young people can get equity in housing without having to save two and a half million dollars for a house in the lower mainland. So these are some structural things we can put in place to encourage our future leaders. All right, thank you very much for that, Cam, and to all of the candidates. You now have an opportunity for open debate on this topic. Sonia, you'll be starting this open debate. Again, candidates, please raise your hands at any point if you want to jump in, and you have a total of two and a half minutes. Sonia, please go ahead and get us started. Yeah, thank you. We've also put uh, many proposals into our platform that will be focused on youth innovation hubs, in investment into early childhood education, public education, post-secondary. We need to have affordable housing in, in every part of British Columbia. We need to have mental health Give your opportunity to interject. Greta Thunberg has done incredible things, more than any individual to promote the voices of youth. And we need to continue to elevate those voices and find those voices within our own community who can continue the work that Greta Thunberg has started. Pam, your opportunity to interject. Thank you. I'll just echo that about the energy that Greta Thunberg brought. I remember going to the climate march in Vancouver last fall and being completely, you know, you turn 360 degrees, totally surrounded by young people. And the energy in that march is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the, the other thing that, that we have in our platform that's really important for young people, of course, is all the supports through different points in, in their education stream, including affordable and accessible post-secondary education, meet them where they are, support them as future leaders. And in the Green Party- I have Party, to cut I you off for time, Cam. Sonia, your opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. We need to bring youth leaders in. And I'm, I'm honored to be endorsed by a number of youth climate leaders, including Harrison Johnson, Grace Sinnott, Emma Jane Burian. These are the leaders and we have already been engaging with them for quite a long time. I will continue to work with them and put their voices front and center. And in, in, in we're going back to Cam, who indicated he'd like to respond again. Thank you. So Kim mentioned earlier that Andrew Weaver put in place, place the BC Greens Leaders Youth Council. I would commit to continuing that work. It's an amazing group. And like any other relationship, you begin by listening. 
what do the youth want to have happen? What do young people want? We build on that. And we've had events during this campaign with young people, including one that started with slam poetry, which was excellent it's on my website. I'd invite you to look at Kim, it. the floor is yours. So we nearly, very nearly had a fourth candidate with us named Brandon Russell. He is a young man who within three days got a hundred signatures for his nomination. However, just was shy six member signatures. He has now joined my team as hel helping me grow the team of young people and engaging them in this leadership contest. All right, thank you all for that open debate and that concludes that segment. We're moving along in this debate. We're now going to shift gears a little bit and give each candidate a chance to ask another candidate a question on any topic they choose. Please keep in mind the time to answer here is shorter. Candidates, you have 45 seconds to respond, so please stick to that time, otherwise I will be cutting you off. The first candidate this time to ask a question is Cam, and Cam, you'll have 30 seconds to ask your question to either candidate you choose, and again, the responding candidate will have 45 seconds to respond. Cam, please go ahead. Thank you. So my question is to Kim. Kim, you mentioned in one of the previous debates that we've had with writing associations that if you became leader, you would take steps to heal the rifts in the Green Party caucus. What exactly would that entail and how would you go about doing that? Well, I'm not sure about the rifts within the Green Party caucus, but if any, any exist, one of my skill sets in any of the positions that I've been in, whether it was joining the chamber board when they were having trouble, I'm a collaborator. I'm a team builder. That is just something that is at the core of my being. Now we have heard rumors that there, there have been some rifts uh, amongst our former leader. I talk to Andrew Weaver almost every week. He is committed to be a consultant uh, under my leadership as I believe he has under yours as well, Cam. So this is something that I think we, we will not lose his wisdom under, under my leadership, which I think. All right, time is up there, Kim. I have to cut you off, but you are next to ask a question to either candidate of your choice. Again, you'll have 30 seconds to pose the question and the responding candidate has 45 seconds for their answer. So Kim, please go ahead. So Sonia, our constitution says that we exist as a party to one, elect MLA candidates and two, to promote our policies and platforms into essentially into legislation. We've heard you speak time and time again about the number of ministry files that you're responsible for, knowing that most MLAs are only responsible for one. How are you going to do the job of gathering the team of MLA candidates due to your calendar constraints in the legislature? Sure. Thank you for the question. And, and as people can already see, I have been endorsed by leaders across the province, elected leaders, youth leaders, environmental leaders, business leaders, and Indigenous leaders. I've begun the work of bringing people into this party and building this party. We have incredible momentum. And it's not about whether I can do this. It, I have absolutely no problem with bringing the the momentum and the team building that we need and we will have in order to be incredibly successful. What I have achieved in the legislature is moving legislation forward that would never have happened. Professional governance, for example, moving issues forward that nobody else is paying attention to, indigenous children. I will continue to do that work and I look forward to building the amazing team we're gonna have. Thank you for that, Sonia. And you are the next to pose a question to either candidate of your choice. You have 30 seconds to ask that question and the responding candidate will have 45 seconds for their response. Please go ahead, Sonia. This is to Cam. In 2017, we learned about campaigning. We built a team here in Cowgen, spent six months uh, getting the success that we had to get elected. And we learned about the other parties. They are ruthless in their campaigning, especially the NDP. As leader, decisions will have to be made every day. Cam, how do you imagine being able to build your own campaign, your first election campaign, as well as being able to lead a team of candidates across the entire province without experience of running in an election? Well, thank you, Sonia, for the question. For 30 years, I've been bringing people together to create solutions. And some of those solutions were complicated. The Eco Lumber Co-op was just an idea. And I brought people together, loggers, environmentalists, communities, Indigenous people, and created an institution that 
process and distributed wood across North America and Europe. When I was acting internationally as a lawyer representing sovereign states, these are countries with multi-billion dollar investment disputes, decisions need to be made like that, that can infect an entire country. And we won cases before the world court or before the world uh, bank in Washington. I have done this high pressure work and built teams for 30 years and I can do it again for the Green Party. All right, thank you very much candidates for your questions to each other and your responses. That concludes that segment. Now to the final segment of the night, and that is questions from stakeholders across the province. We're back to allotting a minute for every candidate's response to these questions. And we'll begin with the first one, which is again recorded on video. This is from Jill Tipping, the president and CEO of BC Tech. Let's play the video. video. My question for the leadership candidates is this. Will you follow your words of support for BC's tech sector and BC's tech workers with funding, with concrete support for increased funding for the programs that are necessary to realize BC's tech potential? Thank you very much for that question, Jill. And Kim, you are the first to respond here. Please go ahead. So many of you know that I was the president of uh, our local Chamber of Commerce, and I wrote a policy for the BC Chamber of Commerce on this specific topic, calling on the provincial government to invest in clean technology and renewable energy. This is one of my, my passions. This is the one of the yeses to the no that I continually talk about as we are going to phase uh, out of fossil fuel uh, industries. So I... I recognized that the BC government nor the BC uh, Chamber of Commerce had, it, had even really thought much about the tech sector. In fact, there wasn't a single policy on the BC Chamber of Commerce's policy book that supported it. I took it then nationally and actually had it passed at the national level in Ottawa in 2015. It is near and dear to my heart. It is the yes to the no that we need to transition off of fossil fuel jobs. Thank you for that, Kim. Sonia, your opportunity to respond. Yeah, thank you. And, and it's great to have this question from Jill. And Jill has presented us with an enormous amount of evidence and data to show that investment in the high tech sector is one of the best investments that any government can make in terms of the employment that cre it creates, the opportunity that it creates, the wealth back to government. And so absolutely, and we have been a champion for the tech sector for the last three years. And even before that, I know that Joe worked with the former leader uh, quite a bit and has worked with Adam and me. And, and of course, we need to invest in into this sector. This is the future of our economy. I look at, uh, we have an animation studio here in Duncan that is creating Academy Award winning uh, programs. We have uh, video games uh, production that, that opens up opportunities to indigenous youth that, that weren't there before. This is one of the most important sectors that we can invest in and we absolutely need to do that. Thank you for that, Sonia. Cam, your opportunity to respond. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Investment is necessary. I know that as an entrepreneur, as an accountant, as someone who's written business plans, who has evaluated, assessed the business plans, I know the importance of capital. Otherwise, things don't go ahead. We can't just hope that things start happening in the tech sector. We need to put the pieces in place to make them happen. And that's why we proposed a green bank. Now, the difference between a green bank and other financial institutions that the environment is embedded in the DNA. So an entrepreneur comes up with a tech idea, an idea, an innovation that's gonna lead the world towards a zero carbon future. That green bank is there to help them with all the different types of capital that are required that fit with that business to support the business plan. And then you tie that in with the incubators and the, the thought leaders and the post-secondary institutions in this province and you support the entrepreneur and you get these ideas off the ground. All right, thank you very much for that, Cam, and to all of the candidates. You all now have an opportunity for open debate on this topic, and you know the rules. It's two and a half minutes total, and if you'd like to interject, please raise your hand and I'll facilitate that. Kim, it's your opportunity to begin the de debate. So as I mentioned, I'm on the I'm a volunteer on the board of Community Futures, and one of the main things that we support is the tech 
uh, community. In fact, we put all of our businesses that we loan money to through the through like a B Corp certified type of, of um, list. And if they if they meet really good- Kim, I have to cut you off before you make profit. that point to let Sonia speak up. Sonia? Thank you. And, and we have in our platform as well, innovation hubs. We have to recognize that investing in the, the foundations for the high-tech industry are essential as well as investing in, in the hubs. And, and as Catherine Holt pointed out, that we also need to invest in the services, government services that make it, it, uh, employers be able to attract more employees to British Columbia. A four day work week uh, is one of the ways of, of looking at this, how we can uh, support that as government, what kind of policies and incentives we can put in. Because we need Anya, to- Anya, have to leave it there to allow Cam an opportunity, Cam? Thank you. So the other piece about the tech sector or any enterprise for that matter is the way that it's structured. That's why we propose cooperatives, I propose a ministry of cooperatives so that any type of enterprise like this doing the good work of moving towards a zero carbon future is structured so that the benefits aren't entirely privatized, they're shared with the workers, they're shared with communities, and that creates the stability for the longer term and distributes and shares all the energy and in innovation in the province in communities so that they're better for the future and it's not just a private wealth. Kim, it's back to you. So as I was mentioning with the Community Futures Loans and Investment Fund, we put our, our, our applicants through a B Corp type certification to ensure that they are meeting the UN sustainability goals within their businesses. If they do well, then they get a cheaper interest rate. So it's similar to this green bank that Cam is talking about. It's just a way of helping British Columbia meet our climate targets, treat employees well, and move forward with the clean technology revolution. Back to you, Sonia. Thanks. We want to attract the very best talent to British Columbia. And in order to do that, we have to have the most livable communities. We have to have the best services, the best education systems. And we have to recognize that we need to support the innovative trailblazing entrepreneurs of the high tech sector. And I'm so excited to be part of that work. And with that, time is up. Thank you to all of you for that open debate. That concludes that part of the segment. We'll move on now to the second video recorded questions from stakeholders in industries across the province. This one is from Veronica Martitius of the BC Civil Liberties Association. Let's play her question. My question for you is how do you envision the future of policing and police accountability in light of sustained biased and violent police practices that will likely continue without disrupting the status quo? Question Veronica and Cam, you are the first to respond. You have one minute. Thank you, Veronica. So what we need to do is redirect resources to professionals who can outreach into the community and support people with all the services that are necessary to alleviate poverty, to alleviate domestic violence, to alleviate uh, addiction issues, to, to make sure that people in the communities are supported. The police aren't always the best source for doing that. And so by ensuring we have the right funding and the right professionals in the communities to proactively address issues, then the police don't need to be there. And one of the really critical ways to do that, of course, is to ensure that everybody is supported with appropriate housing, everybody has appropriate health care and full services, including, as I mentioned earlier, counseling and therapy during times when things are difficult to help alleviate domestic violence situations, and ensure that addiction issues are dealt with in a way that's proactive and reduces the stress that sometimes causes people to fall into addiction. Thank you very much for that, Cam. Kim, your opportunity to respond. We've been seeing with what the police have to respond to is years and years of a lack of investment into our social safety structures. And we, we talk about the, we've, we've hearing about defunding the police and what it is, is we need to refund our social, social safety structures. There's also a, a really good example of how police are are being innovative with CAR, I believe it's 67 or CAR 87, where when they're called to a mental health crisis, they actually bring a mental health worker with them. That is, that is a more appropriate way of dealing with those types of calls. And 
we, we have also seen that with the homeless crisis and the opioid crisis that, that is going on in every community throughout British Columbia, again, that is a lack of support for our social safety structures. Thank you very much for that, Kim. Sonia, your opportunity to respond. Thank you. Let's start with acknowledging and recognizing we have systemic racism in BC and in Canada. And that systemic racism has played out in various government agencies and services and in the police. I cannot imagine what it would be like as a mother to have to talk to my child about how not to be shot by the police. And I know that this is the reality for black people, for people of color and for indigenous people in this province. So we have to acknowledge that we have to start there. And, and uh, the, the work on the, the Re police act is essential to this, but it's starting with that open and honest conversation that we are, are grappling uh, right here in BC and across Canada with the impacts of systemic racism. And we have to get beyond this. We cannot allow these systems to perpetuate the way they have been. All right, thank you very much for that, Sonia. Candidates now have an opportunity for open debate on this topic. Again, you know how this works. You have two and a half minutes for this open debate and Cam, it is your opportunity to begin. Please go ahead. Thank you. So we need to also recognize, of course, that with indigenous people, there's intergenerational trauma that stems back to residential schools. And we need to address then all the issues that come with that. And at the same time, this is where universal basic income comes in and helps with people so that they're able to be safe, so that they're able to have housing, so that they're able to have food on the table and don't have to get involved in any situation that the police would need to be called. So again, the social safety- interrupt for time there, Cam, Sonia, your opportunity to interject. Yeah, and I, I think it is important that we are investing in the services that we need to have more of. And, and we've seen, uh, especially in 2001, the early days of the Campbell era, where so many of the services that were supporting families that were helping stop inequality were taken away. We've worked with the BC Psychologists Association to look at MSP covering mental health care in British Columbia. That would be a start. And we also have to look at the laws and policies that regulate all of these services, including the police. Anya, I have to interject. Kim, your opportunity. So I think we've all seen the, the proportion of Indigenous people who are in our court systems and in our prisons is absolutely egregious. And I know the mayor of Vancouver has been a big proponent of stopping the carding system. And that's something that I, it absolutely has to happen in order to change that proportion. All right, and Cam. Thank you. Yeah, to build on that, of course, there's a shocking disproportionate number of Indigenous people that have been incarcerated in this country, and that needs to be addressed. We also need to look at the decriminalization of simple possession of illicit substances. So BC can ask the federal government for an exemption under the Controlled Drug and Substances Act to remove that, that police-based approach to, to drug issues and, and allow it instead to be thought of as a health issue with the user at the center. All right, Sonia, you get the final word here. Thank you. Building resilience in our society includes building social resilience. Education is a significant part of this. And starting with the acknowledgement of our history in Canada, it is a colonial history, it is a racist history, and we need to move beyond that. And we need to acknowledge that it is Black people, people of colour, Indigenous people who are suffering these inequalities. All right, thank you very much for that, Sonia, and to the rest of the candidates. We are now going to move on to our third stakeholder question. This is from Scott Bernstein, the Director of Policy with the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition. Let's play the video. I'd like to know whether you support legal regulation of drugs and why or why not, and if you do, what you would do to further this conversation in BC. All right, thank you very much for that question. Sonia, you are the first to respond and you have one minute. So in our platform in 2017, we supported decriminalization of drugs. We need to look at evidence-based approaches to solving 
the health crisis that is the overdose and opioid crisis in British Columbia. We cannot treat this as a criminal issue. It is absolutely a health issue. Adam and I have met with the BC Center for uh, Substance Use. We have met with other experts. We need to approach this from the lens of what best practices and what the experts tell us, the evidence will, will help us achieve the outcomes we need to do. Here in Cowichan, we created a Cowichan leadership group largely because of the crisis that we have here and working together, focusing on people's need to have housing, they need to have treatment and support in community, and they need to have be able to access all of these with dignity. And we absolutely, yesterday was Overdose Awareness Day, we have to stop the harm and the deaths that are happening from overdoses right now. All right, thank you for that, Sonia. Cam, your opportunity to respond. Thank you, Scott, for the question. I've already mentioned in the earlier round that I completely support the idea of decriminalization. We do that by asking for an exemption from the federal government under the Controlled Drug and Substances Act for the crime of, of simple possession. But we also need to recognize all the other pieces that need to be in place. During this campaign, I. I spoke with a father who had lost his 26 year old son to addiction. And that kind of pain just doesn't go away. And sometimes people are overdosing in situations where no one even knows that they're users. During the COVID times, people are more often by themselves. They're dying in residences. It's not just people on the street. And that's happening because of stress that's caused by COVID and other situations, we need to address this, the reasons, the underlying reasons that lead to addiction. So that includes, of course, all the supports we've been talking about around housing, around universal basic income and so on. And then when we get to the, the, the addiction issues themselves, there are fewer of them to address. Right. Thank you for that, Cam. And Kim, your opportunity to respond. This is really near and dear to my heart today. Um, at 12 o'clock noon, I witnessed two of my friends bury their 22-year-old son. He used alone and he passed away. He had overdosed in March and was brought back. And they are in the health, they are healthcare professionals and they fought for his entire elementary school years, his entire high school years and his entire young adult life to get the supports that he needed and they were unable to. Now, Dr. Bonnie Henry put out a report last year called Stop the Harm, which calls on the decriminalization of people for personal use of their drugs. And I 100% support that. Not only that, I was talking to Dr. Chris Van Veen, who's the Director of Strategic Initiatives. And I have a feeling I'm gonna have to finish this in our, uh, in our debate. Thank you very much for that, Kim, and my condolences to everyone uh, that was involved with that this afternoon and uh, to all the friends and family. That's uh, awful, and there are too many stories like that. The open debate does begin with you, and again, you have two and a half minutes to debate this topic. Kim, please get us started. So repeating, Dr. Chris Van Veen, Director of Strategic Initiatives of Vancouver Coastal Health, he said, if we would only give clean supply, the effect would be immediate. There would be less deaths immediately, less people in jail, less clogged court systems, less petty crime, and all of this, and less out, burnt out outreach workers, emergency responders, and hospital workers, and all of the savings from that can go into the other supports that we need. This is a humane thing to do, and it is the fiscal. Kim, I will come back to you, do. but I have to interrupt there and let Sonia have a word. Sonia. Yeah, so one of the things that we've advocated for here in, in, in Cowichan as part of our Cowichan Leaderships Group was to be one of the pilot projects for safe supply in British Columbia. And, and we were successful in getting the funding from the federal government to have safe supply here. And we're advocating as well for treatment, for in-community treatment, which is completely lacking, not only in our community, but in communities all across British Columbia. And this has to be a priority that we need that care in community for people so that they can access it as soon as On that note, as Tanya, Cam, your opportunity to interject. Thank you. So certainly we need safe supply. We need safe injection sites. And by moving towards decriminalization as well, then what happens is we remove the stigma. 
And we, we start to be able to treat this as a health issue with the users at the center. We can't tell every user what to do. We need to treat them individually. We need to listen to them and we need to give them all the supports in their lives that are necessary so that they can deal with pain management in other ways and non-pharmaceutical ways so that they can be supported with the stress that leads to addiction to begin with. Right back to Kim. Nobody chooses to have a mental health problem just like nobody chooses to have cancer or diabetes. And we don't have any problem giving radiation treatment or chemotherapy treatment or whatever other treatments are necessary for other diseases. We need to stop the stigmatization of people who essentially are self-medicating because they can't get the help that they need. All right, and Sonia, you get the final word here. Yeah, and and Kim, I want to extend my condolences to you and to your friends as well. This is a a tragic thing that you've gone through today. I'm very sorry for what's happened. We'll have to end it on that note. All right, thank you so much to all of you. This has been a very engaging debate. That brings us to the end of this segment and the end of this debate. The candidates now have an opportunity to make their closing statements. They will have one minute for their remarks. And Kim... We will start with you. You have one minute for your closing statement. Okay, I just need to compose myself. Thank you for that. So you can see that we have three incredible candidates here. And I want to tell you that I am not running against Cam and Sonia. I'm running for the party. And with all of the evidence that COVID-19 has laid bear during this time, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to promote a green, inclusive, and fair recovery to British Columbia. British Columbia needs the BC Green Party, and the BC Green Party needs a leader who can articulate our message beyond the green bubble and bring forward solutions that are the yes to the no that we've been missing for decades. Now, you have two candidates who have... have, um, political experience, and we have two candidates that have the time. I have both. So I'm asking members and supporters to elect me to do the heavy lifting between now and the next election to bring that team of MLA candidates into the next election. It's our time to lead. Thank you very much for that, Kim. Sonia, your closing statement, you have one minute. Thank you. When I speak of my readiness to lead, I speak from a place of having been leading and achieving outcomes in Shawnigan, in Cowichan, and in the BC legislature for the last nine years. I'm not interested in the old ways of doing politics that have gotten us exactly to where we are today. Now more than ever, BC needs the BC Greens. The other two parties are content to fight over the status quo or tinker around the edges. We have pushed for and achieved transformative change already. I have an evidence-based platform that will deliver a more resilient, a more sustainable, and a more just province. And I've shown what is possible by achieving again and again what others have told me is impossible. And I've started every time from a place of integrity, kindness, and building connection. We have already come such a long way, and we are just getting started. All right. Thank you for that, Sonia. Cam, your closing statement, you have one minute. Thank you, Nitu, and thank you for everyone joining tonight in this important democratic exercise. And thank you, Kim and Sonia. I look forward to working with both of you. But we need to focus on Horgan and Wilkinson because they don't get it. They don't understand that we are not separate from nature and we are not separate from each other. As a lawyer, I've represented entire countries in international disputes I'm ready to stand up to Horgan and Wilkinson. And as a community organizer, an accountant, an entrepreneur, I'm ready to restart BC for the clean innovation future that will lead the world, for the revitalization of indigenous legal systems that will lead to a lasting justice, for the cooperative structures that ensure we can all participate. Please join me. On September 5th, I'm asking for your vote. Together, we can do this. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
very much, Cam, and thank you very much to all of the candidates. This has been a very engaging evening. You have, for the most part, followed time, topic, and all the rules, made my job very easy. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of you who are watching at home on your various screen screens. That concludes the debate. A media scrum will follow this. I want to give a big thank you as well to the questioners tonight who submitted questions to help uh, contribute to this debate and make it what it was. And especially to those of you who are at, in your homes, in your workplaces, watching live, wherever you are, on behalf of everyone here, have a great night.